This is my favorite topic. And this is a topic that everybody needs, but they don't know that sometimes. So making sense of what, how, and why people think and behave differently. So you can create synergy instead of driving each other crazy. It's a pretty relevant topic and it's not business related. It affects us in our private and professional life as well. So why common sense? It's such an easy thing to talk about common sense. And I'm pretty sure that you had the feeling when you were talking to someone that, oh my God, that person has no common sense. They just don't get me at all. And most people think, yeah, yeah, it happens so many times. But at the same time, probably those people had exactly the same feeling about you, just for a different reason. The level of frustration was probably very, very similar, but we never think about that because common sense is so common that we don't question it. And it's based on the golden rule that treat people the way you want to be treated, which sounds really nice from an ethical and biblical perspective that be nice to people, be respectful. But that also implies that everybody is like you. They like what you like and they are scared of the things that you are terrified with. So that's kind of selfish. The other problem with the common sense is that it's subjective. We can't really explain it because it's up to us. Something makes sense from our perspective, based on our experiences, based on our values and beliefs, not from yours. But we also expect other people to come to the same conclusion, even though they have a really different background and experience. The other problem is that you sense it. You don't know it. We can't really explain it. It's just a set of unwritten rules that they have to follow. Sounds like culture, pretty much, because we know what we should do, what we shouldn't, and we just follow it. But if I have to explain it, I would be struggling with it until something goes against it. Then I know that it was wrong. And it's not common practice. Just because people know about something that they should be doing, it doesn't mean that they do it. And that's the challenge there. So if you think about that, you have a tiny piece of map of London and then you go to New York and you try to find something, then it will be quite difficult. And it's very logical and it makes sense. But this is what most people don't realize that when you talk to someone, the exact same process happens. We use a tiny piece of our own mental map. We assume it's hundred percent. And we also assume that other people have the same map. And that's where communication breaks down. 95% of our actions are based on unconscious bias, driven by values, beliefs, and memories we're not even aware of. 95% of the time, we are on autopilot. And that's why it's difficult to explain it. And it is an important topic because 60 to 80% of all difficulties in a company stem from strained relationships between employees. It's not because they are not good enough. It's because they clash. And the top three reasons are clashes of personalities, clashes of values, and poor leadership. And all three of them stem from the same source, the lack of understanding of why people think and behave differently. 60 to 80%, it's not policies, it's not technology, it's people. It is an important topic. And it created a mindset gap that we have the best intention, but the impact is really different. So for example, 86% of leaders see themselves as inspiring, but 82% of employees think they're not. That's a huge gap. 80% of CEOs consider their customer service outstanding. According to Salesforce, only 8% of customers agree with them. How does it affect business? Maybe they have the best intention, they have the budget, they have the policies, but the impact, not so good. 89% of leaders think staff leave for more money. Not exactly true. That's only 12% of them. But there is more to this. 75% of employees leave managers, not companies. And everybody has a story probably. And the people who stay, they cost 37 pounds, 34% uh, more in terms of disengagement. That's a lot of money lost. 89% of new hires fail within 18 months because they cannot fit in. 70% of leaders believe they are in the top 10%. That's really crowded there and probably it's not true. And 79% of potential in a team is lost due to interaction gap. And I'm going to share this research with you because this 
doesn't make sense at all. Jacob Morgan published a book, and I think you can pre-order it now, but he published an article about it. He had one question. He asked 140 top CEOs, what we should be teaching leaders now to prepare for the future. And he came up with four mindsets and five skills. One of those was technology. The other eight are directly connected to understanding people, not just others, but ourselves. In terms of mindset, growth mindset, teamwork, inclusion, and global mindset. In terms of skills, self-awareness, innovation, communication, and coaching. People skills are not optional. They are important. If you don't understand yourself and you don't understand other people, you're not going to be in business for too long. And I had to learn the hard way as well. So this is me, this good looking guy in the uniform with my brother. I grew up in a little village and I had no experience with different cultural groups. That's what I thought so. So I, st I had no idea what I wanted to do. So I studied Italian. I got a master's in Italian linguistics. Then as soon as I finished, I came to the UK for a summer, but it was 16 years ago. So three years later, I went to Sussex and I got to do a master's in international management. And this was a bit more practical because I replicated an old research and I wanted to compare the Hungarian managers with the Western Europeans. The trick was that in Hungary, we had two generations, the one that grew up in communism and the new generation that was affected by it indirectly. And the data showed that the gap between the new generations in Hungary was much bigger than the gap between the new generation and the Western Europeans. And technically it contradicted everything that we learned about what all the academics claimed, that culture is country specific and stable. So said, no, that's not true. But anyway, who are you to question people who've been around for 40, 50, 60 years? You know, you're just a student, even though that department itself is number one in the world. I forgot about it. So I started my own company, which was a restaurant booking site. It's a pretty simple business model. You book a table, we get the money, but the idea was much more exciting. So we started with 35 restaurants here in Brighton. And then in one year, we had 5,500 all over the UK. It became a joint venture with a software company. And on paper, everything made sense. We were getting the results, but on a personal level, I couldn't work with the other CEO who was French. No. So we got to the point where we had to get out of the business, sold the shares, and this is when I started my research. How come? That was the exact topic of my dissertation from the best university in the world. I had years of experience and I couldn't put that theory into practice. So I got certified in a lot of different things because I wanted to understand what went wrong and how we could fix it. And I got, my assumption was that if all of these models are or were correct, there must be a huge overlapping part. Maybe they use different metaphors, different colors, slightly different definitions. It doesn't really matter. There must be a structure beneath the surface and that's what I'm looking for. So that's what we talk about. So this webinar is based on the seven most popular questions I got in the last more than 10 years as an executive coach and trainer and also researcher. Questions that don't make sense. How come I can hit it off with people from the other side of the globe, but I clash with somebody I grew up with? What's the reason? Well, when we mention the word culture or cross-culture or interculture, this is what most people think about countries. The five do's and don'ts in different countries, statistically average values and beliefs, which can be important. If you move to a country, yes, of course, you have to learn about what people are used to. But that's what culture is, what we are used to, not necessarily who we are. And there's a big difference there. But sometimes now we talk about generations. I mean, immediately, if the country-specific approach was correct, there would be no millennial issue. That makes sense. And then sometimes we also talk about genders. So these are the three main culture groups. These are the ones that most companies focus on when they talk about diversity. Now, if you look at the research where they compared 17 different cultural groups in terms of practicality, then they were the bottom three, the most impractical ones. If you look at the range of differences, 
country of origin, generations and genders. And it makes sense because you don't choose these cultural groups. It's not up to you, but when you are there, then you learn how to navigate efficiently in that environment. And at the same time, we all belong to 15 or 20 cultural groups at the same time. Country of origin is one of them. So if you just focus on that, it's like washing only your head and not the rest of your body. For how long can you do that? I mean, it's not going to get you the results that you're hoping for. So when you have a conversation with someone, what are the chances that the other person belongs to the same 15 or 20 cultural groups like you? It's next to zero. So every single conversation is a cross-culture dialogue. But most people are not aware of it. So they are not actively looking for the solution that would unlock that potential. But if we want to go deeper, then we can see that there are different personality types within each cultural group, sometimes with completely opposing preferences. And now it's getting complicated. I mean, if you look at the surface level of diversity, it's insanely complex. It is. Plus, if you look at research again, the visible layer of diversity has no proven benefit unless there is cognitive diversity as well. And this is the key, that if you look at the cognitive level beneath the surface, there are a limited number of values and psychological needs. The behaviors and the best practices that we use to express those values and meet those needs, yeah, that's insanely complex. But beneath the surface, there are limited number of levers. How come diversity is apparently good for business, but it feels stressful and we have more conflicts? I mean, this is what companies read about. Diversity and inclusion is good for the business. Not exactly, not always. It depends on how you use it. Because if you look at these devices, then probably you had most of them in the 80s or 90s. And it's pretty easy to understand that the new, new versions would be really different. So the expertise that was enough to fix and use these ones wouldn't be enough to fix and use the new versions. That's obvious. But today you can replace all of them with a smartphone. You can. They seamlessly integrated all those functions into one portable user-friendly device. The technology behind it is complicated, but for you as an end user, it's amazing. It makes your life so much easier. But what happens if you press those devices together? Are they going to turn into a smartphone? No, of course not. But then how come this is what companies try to do? They employ a lot of different people and then they teach them how to be normal. They call it onboarding, but technically they press them together and they expect them to work like a smartphone. And that doesn't happen. We saw the statistics. When I did a workshop for BBC, they had 17,000 employees and they were talking about celebrating and tolerating diversity, which was fantastic. I mean, so much better than hating out each other. But you cannot just turbocharge your car by celebrating your engine. You have to understand how the different parts work together so you can optimize them. That's how we create synergy. That's how we create superior performance. But that's not based on common sense. And this is the problem that companies read about diversity and inclusion. It must be good for the business and they rely on good intention and common sense. But it's almost like giving you all the parts for an airplane. If you don't know how to put them together, it's not going to fly. But what if you come to the wrong conclusion and you think, you know what, airplanes don't fly. That wasn't the problem. And that's the challenge with diversity as well. It does work, but we have to learn how to make it work. This is one of my favorite videos explaining the power of perspective. It's just a few seconds. It's pretty smart. So now imagine that you are standing in front of it. I'm standing next to it. And we have a disagreement because you say it's a giraffe, I say it's an elephant. And if there's no psychological safety and trust between us, then we are going to put all of our energy into convincing the other one that we are the smart ones, we are right, and the other person is not. We do that. But what if we compromise and we meet in the middle, somewhere here in the corner? then it's a mess, we don't see anything. 
So sometimes we have to go to the other side completely so we can see the same situation from a different perspective and then it makes sense. But our brain is not designed for that. It's not designed to make us happy. It's designed to make us safe and efficient. That's it. So this is something we need to learn. It's all about that kind of cognitive flexibility. But imagine if there's a disagreement, then the default position is that if I'm right, then it is obvious that you are wrong. I've been never asked the right questions that you think that you are right. Okay, so what can you see that I cannot? What do you know that I don't? If you are able to ask these questions, then diversity can lead to innovation. But diversity without inclusion turns into liability. How come most people in my company seem to be the same type in different countries? They're not supposed to be different. I mean, that's exactly what the interculture models are about. Not exactly, because we talk about homophilic diversity. It sounds like a nasty word, but it's not. It just means that we hang out with people who are like us inside. This is what we like and trust, people like us. So what you see here, that was 10 senior leaders from eight different countries and three continents. So on the surface, really diverse, beautiful. It looks good on the website. But this is the team report. On the cognitive level, the diversity index was 22%. So if you look at the sliding scales as a range of perspectives, as a range of approaches to problems and opportunities, then you can see that everybody's standing in the same place, 22%. And that makes sense because imagine that if you have to hire someone, you know, you have enough stress in your life. Why would you employ someone who disagrees with you? It's much easier to get someone who is like you. And this is the result of that. But if your cognitive diversity index is 22%, then it means that your blind spot is 78. So imagine if you have a problem or opportunity here in the middle and then everybody's standing in this corner, then do you feel safe? Do you think that you can make the best decision because everybody can see the giraffe? Not really. But this is the challenge because imagine that you have a board meeting with 10 people, you make a decision and everybody agrees, then it feels right but it doesn't make it true. And this is a very typical case study. And that's the reason why visible diversity has no proven benefit unless there is cognitive diversity as well. Otherwise, it's like having 11 goalkeepers in a football team. That's not what we want. It feels okay, it's a good chat, but that's not the goal. How come you talk about scientifically validated intercultural models, but my own result is nowhere near those scores? And that's exactly the problem I had. We talk about a model, it's based on science, statistics, everything else, and they complete the individual assessment and they are nowhere near the national scores. And that's when they ask you, why are we doing this? And it has a place because when you move to a country, learn about what people are used to. But if your success depends on how well you understand an individual, they can be really misleading. Because so far, every time I asked someone if they thought they were statistically average nationals, they said no. So but why do you think that other people are? And it's true that they conform to a norm in their own environment. But on an individual level, it's a very different solution. And this is what <laughs> the US Air Force had to learn. Because in the 1950s, the pilots had a problem. They didn't perform well. And then the scientists thought, ah, we know why. Because the cockpit was designed for the average pilot from the 1920s. And since then, you know, they are big boys now. So it's obvious. We have to design the perfect cockpit based on the average pilot in the 1950s. And that's what they did. They asked 4,000 pilots. They measured them on 10 dimensions and they created the perfect cockpit. But it didn't work. The performance didn't improve. And then they looked at the numbers. So they expected most of the people to fall in the average range. The actual percentage was zero. And then they thought, you know what? Let's just stick to three dimensions out of the 10. Even then it was three and a half percent. There is no average person. It just doesn't happen. That's the problem with that. We invest more and more in so many workshops and we use a lot of models. How come they are not getting the results that they promise? Whose fault is that? Well, let's not talk about faults. Let's talk about responsibility. So I used to do martial arts when I was younger and I was 
national champion in jiu-jitsu. I always loved it and I watched a lot of documentaries. It's a beautiful thing. And I found one that was striking. This guy is called the Padded Man. Fully protected, you can kick him, punch him, you do what you want, he's still happy. You can practice. So the experiment was that they invited a lot of different martial art experts. So everybody was a master. Black belt, kung fu, karate, wrestling, boxing, taekwondo, a lot of different things. And they said, could you fight this guy? And everybody said, of course, I'm a master, why not? But the trick was that they put them in a room with this guy, one by one. And when they said fight, this guy started to run towards them, swear at them, scream at them. One of them ran away, some of them froze, and only a few of them could fight back. Which was weird because everybody was a master. But it's not surprising. Because Kung Fu Master against Kung Fu Master, yeah, that good. But Kung Fu Master against Crazy Guy, he had no idea what to do. Because the Padded Man caught him off guard. When you have too many techniques, and it's a very different context, it's difficult to do it. It's difficult to use it. But the ones with less techniques, they could fight back. Like boxing, Thai boxing, wrestling. They had less techniques, but they practiced them so many times that they became instinctive, they became part of them. So they could actually focus on the task ahead rather than on the techniques. And this is what I noticed in, in our field as well. There's a workshop for everything. People forget more than 95% of that after a month if they took notes, if they didn't, then even more. And they don't know what to do with it. It's all about the follow-up, it's all about the repetitive learning. It's not about adding something on top of a non-existing foundation. The other problem is that most of the intercultural models and leadership models were created in the 60s and 70s. Based on the answers from people who grew up without internet, EU, cheap flights, most of them are not with us anymore. And even though we love our great grandparents, we don't think like them. We have different challenges and they require different solutions. And this is the problem that more than 95% of companies buy and sell solutions created in the 60s and 70s. And yes, there are some universal laws, but the world changed a lot. If you're an accountant or a lawyer, you have to be up to date in your field. It's not optional. If you're a coach or trainer or consultant, then you don't. And that can be unethical. So what's more important, personality type or cultural background? Can you compare them? And this is the eternal question. And often the trainers claim that, no, you cannot. It's like comparing apple and pear. And if you look at the superficial layer of diversity, yes, true. If you look at the cognitive level, then yes, you can. Indeed, you have to. Because the human mind is complicated, but it's really simple in terms of principles because you do everything to avoid pain and to move towards pleasure. This is what we do. It sounds very objective, but it is very, very subjective. Because maybe something is a pleasure to you, it's a pain to me. So why do we what we do? Well, our behavior is driven by what we consider right and true. These are values and beliefs. And then also what we need and want. And there's one more thing, what our environment considers normal. So the first two are about your personality, what's natural to you and what our environment considers normal, that's culture. What's normal around you? And that can be much stronger than our personality. Our personality determines how we want to behave and culture determines how we should, or technically how we have to behave. It cannot really separate them. So if you look at the individual behavior, we do what we want to reflect our values and meet our needs, ideally. So if you look at, for example, Arnold, he is extroverted, he wants to win, he wants to be in charge, then he's going to behave very differently to someone who is more introverted, somebody who needs more certainty. That's kind of straightforward. Then we talk about culture. There are so many different definitions, but let's stick to the basic one. It's a group habit driven by values and needs. Started with homophilic diversity, a group of people with similar values and needs got together because it felt right. So they accepted something as normal and it was good for everyone. But if one of them sets up a company, then the company culture would be based on the same values and needs, probably, because corporate culture is the behavior that is rewarded and punished. 
So the CEO is going to reward the behavior that is in line with his values and punish the one that isn't. But if you look at the United States, it wasn't founded by people who were bound by the need for certainty at all. Otherwise, they would have never left Europe. So as you can see that the underlying values and drivers of individual behavior are exactly the same as the underlying values and drivers of group behavior. And that's exactly why we can measure it. But it gets complicated when somebody joins the group who has very different values and needs. And now we know that conformity is powerful. So this person would conform to the norms, but then the gap between what's natural to him and what is normal around him is too big, then probably he would burn out. If he doesn't conform to the norms, then we saw the statistics. 89% of new hires fail within 18 months because they cannot fit in. So because the underlying values and drivers are the same, that's why we can measure the mindset gap between two individuals, an individual and a group, or even between two groups. So if you look at the intercultural models, then they talk about, for example, Germany, that this is normal behavior there. But it doesn't mean that everybody is the same type at all, because even in Germany, there are different personality types, for example, a D type of person. So the behavior would be slightly different to someone from the US probably, because a dominant behavior style in the US is accepted and encouraged much more than it is in Germany. So technically, the underlying values and drivers are the same, but the behavior can be different because our cultural background can tone down or amplify it. How can we spend a fortune on employing outstanding people, but they seriously underperform as a team? And this is very relevant because we employ a lot of different people. We hope to create synergy by combining their skills. In reality, that's not what happens. Because 90% of business is interaction between people who think and behave differently. So it can be 100% of the same nationality. Probably they still have different personality types because they have different values and needs, which gives them different perspectives. So maybe on the surface, they behave similarly as a group. But if you look at beneath the surface, you find a problem. And this is what the three circle partners in the US wanted to to find out exactly. So they gave an individual assessment to each member of the team. They scored them individually and then the team had to submit the same collectively. What you can see here, the blue number, this is the team result. The green one is the best possible individual score. You can see there's a huge gap there. So they repeated it many, many times and the average was 79%. That's how much potential is lost in a team because they cannot work together because of the interaction gap, 79%. So if you think about it, this is money left on the table. This is potential waiting to be unlocked. And that's exactly our topic. Relying on common sense and good intention resolves this. So now the question is that, is it 90% in your team or 50? But what's guaranteed is that there's so much potential than you realize and it's lost because of misunderstandings, because people don't understand themselves and others. So the outcome of that research was Global Disc, which is now ICF accredited, multi-award winning behavior model, explaining how personality type and culture background influence all three layers of identity. What, how, and why we do act, feel, and think the way we do. So we don't talk about culture and personality, we talk about individual and group mindset. So we can remove the illusion of separation. Probably most of you know Simon Sinek, and he created the Golden Circle. And he's one of the very few geeks who managed to become famous for the right reasons. Because he did the right thing. There was a complex topic and he made it uncomplicated. He sprinkled some neuroscience to it and some fancy words, but the point is that he created a kind of awareness that when you talk about what you do or how, that's not too exciting. But when you talk about your why, then you tap into the limbic brain and that's when you connect with people. So if you look at the training industry, the psychometric and behavioral models like this and MBTI explain how the different personality types tend to behave if they are not influenced by anything or anyone around them, which is pretty impossible because the context is important. Then if you look at the intercultural models, 
then they focus on the statistically average values, the Y of different nationalities and maybe generations. But the problem is that more than 80% of cultural differences are within countries, not between them. And we all belong to 15 or 20 cultural groups at once. And sometimes this is surprising to trainers, 80% of cultural differences. And yes, but think about it. If you clash with someone in your own country, you label it as personal differences. But if the exact same situation happens with you and another person from a different country, then we call it cultural differences. In reality, we talk about exactly the same thing on a cognitive level. We just label them differently. So that's also good news that we have more experience. And that's exactly what Global Disc is about. It explains what, how, and why we do the way we do. So if you look at the previous examples, when I talked about the different devices and the smartphone, technically Global Disc seamlessly integrates all the most research models into one practical framework. And that was my assumption more than 10 years ago, that if they are correct, there must be a huge overlapping part. And that's exactly what we can measure. What's the gap between what's natural to you and what is normal around you? Or what is natural to another person? So there was a question, what's the difference between DISC and global DISC? So we already mentioned that DISC focuses on personality types and they completely ignore the other 50% the culture intelligence part. So we can do the same thing when you take the report. The what part is about this. But then we go deeper. So we talk about the how and the why. Because I can say that you're a D type of person. What's the reason? How do you behave? What's important to you and what do you need? We go into the details. And we can also measure the cognitive diversity of the team to measure your blind spot. It is important. But when you get your report, so technically you take the report, you get a 42 page document, and there's also a 40 minute online course built in using augmented reality. Then it's informative, it's great, but it's not going to change your life, just like a workshop, because nothing happens then. People go back to normal, they stick to their habits. But the report comes alive when you compare it to something or someone and that's exactly what we can do. We can compare your results with another person for troubleshooting. We can compare it with the group. So our partners use it for recruitment or leadership training. So we can see why a leader cannot bring out the best in their team, despite their best intention, why the golden rule can backfire. We, we do that. Then we can also measure the gap between two departments. Let's see why they cannot get along. We can measure them against 16 different disk profiles, around 50 countries. Everything makes sense when you compare them to something or someone because everything is relative. But we can also that, do that on a group level and that's when the report comes alive. But just because you read it and you understand it, nothing is going to change. How can we follow it up? So that's why we created the Quest, which is an interactive coaching platform. It's not a boring online course that you can click through. No, no, no. It's different. So technically, it's designed for your results. You take the assessment, and then you get access to this platform. And you do what you normally do, so you're not wasting your time. But you would do it slightly differently, depending on the task or the mission that you get. So you get a different outcome, a different feeling. You go back to the app. You answer some reflective questions, and then you can unlock the next one. And every single mission is going to push you out of your comfort zone just a little bit more. So it takes around two and a half, three months maybe, but you enjoy it, you experience it because information doesn't lead to transformation. People learn from experience. So we give them both. That's the point. The reason why we do this is because we need to level up. So I'm pretty sure that you heard this expression and it's from the gaming industry that, you know, when you play a video game, then there's a level, then you have different challenges. And at the end, there's a monster that you have to destroy using all the skills that you learn. If you do that, you can go to the next level. If you don't, then you do it again. And this is what most people do. I've done it for years, running around on the same level because I didn't learn my lesson. So. That's the reason why we have to learn about ourselves first, because when we have clients, they want to learn about other people, how to manage them. They want to learn the tricks and the hacks. So no, 
Day one is about you. Because I promise that you don't know a lot about yourself. It's not even your fault. So let's focus on that. And then we can learn about other people on common sense. Because cultural differences are just clashes of common senses. So if you look at it that way, immediately it's not a binary option that I'm right, you're wrong. No, we can be both right. But question is, what do you do about that? Do you clash or do you learn from each other? And if you can, then you can get along and then you can get ahead. There's no shortcut here, especially on the top. Everybody's smart. What makes a difference is people skills, how you make them feel. If your customers or employees feel misunderstood, they go somewhere else where they feel valued, where they feel like being at home. They have plenty of options. And it's not just a good idea. Global Disc is ICF accredited and we won several awards. And it's also endorsed by the leading practitioners in the world, like Marshall Goldsmith and John Matone as well. And these are the guys who work with the best of the best and they make them even better. And they give their name to it. And that's, that's amazing. I mean, I've got academic background, but most clients are not interested in that. They just want to know how you can solve that problem with the least amount of hassle and time. And this is the exciting part that the book is coming out. So both of them contributed to the book. And this is about the topic, Uncommon Sense in Unusual Times. So yes, technically that's the VUCA environment because this is getting more and more important and all the research is confirmed that if you don't understand yourself and other people, you're not going to be in business for too long. So technically this is what we do. This is what we teach. That's how we work with companies. But if you want to use it, then you can also do that. So the next upcoming certification is in Indonesia with Vicky and she's a master trainer there running really exciting projects. <laughs> I learned a lot there. So if you can go there and contact her directly. Otherwise, if you want to do it online, we can also do that. No need to travel three times, five hours, three weekends, and we can get it done. That's the plan.